Okay, we're going to get started if everyone can get seated. It's, uh, it's a great uh, pleasure to have my former boss and current colleague, Steve Hyman, uh, <laughs> here in the Stanley Center um, Translational Neuroscience uh, Series, co-hosted with the uh, Poitras Center here uh, at the McGovern Institute. Um, I want to just hit a few highlights from Steve's CV before I just talk a little bit about uh, my history with Steve. Uh, I'll, I'll sit down. <laughs> Maybe I'll lay down. <laughs> Steve uh, got his BA from Yale, went on to Harvard where he got his MD in residency in psychiatry. Uh, he then actually became a bench scientist at Harvard, was studying, doing some of the earliest studies on gene expression, his relationship to dopamine and learning and, and addiction. Uh, and he was also head of the Harvard Center for Mind, Brain, and Behavior. And then he was tapped to be the NIMH intramural director, uh, where I was the, um, and, and, and then I was appointed uh, scientific director uh, under Steve, and uh, I'll talk about that in a bit. But uh, after shaking things up there for a few years, uh, he was put in the witness protection program. The authorities moved him into a job as provost at Harvard, where he served uh, also for a number of years, and, uh, and then moved to the Stanley Center, where he's our colleague today. Uh, when I was at NIMH, it was clear Steve came in to move the NIMH into the modern age. Uh, and that was not just the intramural program, which probably needed it the most, but Steve was determined to move not only intramural, but the extramural program. And, and amazingly, even the entire field of psychiatry, he was going to try to move into the modern age. And while he was a tremendous believer in behavior and the analysis of behavior, he wanted the field to be grounded in genetics, molecular biology, and the role of genes and um, and intracellular pathways in shaping neural circuits that would then lead to behavior with the ultimate goal of helping people suffering from mental illness. And whereas not everyone accepted that his philosophy and how the field should be organized, uh, they did deeply respect his commitment to helping people with mental illness. And I think um, he did a, he moved the needle tremendously uh, for both NIMH and the field into what is now the, I think, modern, modern neuroscience. Uh, after uh, going to Harvard, where he also shook things up, and I think, he was, I think he was actually able to shake things up because he was overshadowed by someone who, uh, who was bad like cop. the bad cop to, to Steve's good cop. Uh, and. Uh, is pushing the, the Harvard uh, Alston Initiative, for example, um, <laughs> amongst many other things. Uh, but then, uh, but then he, they were able to recruit him to be head of the Stanley Center, where there, he was able to take over from a tremendous foundation that had been built up by Ed Skolnick, who shared this philosophy of grounding the field in genetics, uh, molecular biology, but then, again, um, seeing how the um, genes and gene pathways influence cells and circuits and behavior, and Steve is now championing that effort even more. And so we're delighted to hear about his thoughts today on the field, the Stanley Center, and where he thinks neuroscience is going. Steve, please. See, Bob, I thought you were going to talk about some of our um, reviews of uh, intramural scientists together and the hard work you had to do afterwards. But that can be for after a beer sometime with everybody in the audience. So it's great to be here. This, this is going to be um, a somewhat high level talk because a lot of people in the community keep asking, you know, what is it that we're doing? And uh, I think it is a, a great opportunity to not only share what we're doing at the Stanley Center, but also hopefully to enlist no small number of you in solving, uh, helping to solve the very, very hard problems that we face. I just always pick an introductory slide to remind us of the gravity of the problem. And 
this is an interesting slide because what it shows is this measure of years of healthy life lost to disability. Uh, and this is counts, literally the uh, World Health Organization and the World Bank counts these things. So this is in millions. And this is age from, you know, birth to 70. Uh, and what you can see is that the, the neuropsychiatric disorders are the chronic disabling disorders of the young. So normally we think of chronic illness, we think of, uh, you know, the late stages of life, we think of diabetes and heart disease uh, and uh, other chronic ills like that. But, but uh, you know, autism has its onset in the first years of life and is unremitting and ADHD when severe, also very early and disabling and uh, schizophrenia, which we'll talk about more, onset uh, late teens, early 20s, in a cruel sense, just after families and society have maximally invested in a young person in terms of education and development. And uh, people with schizophrenia have a you know, course of some, some modest remissions and relapses, but in general, people are disabled for the rest of their lives, uh, and so on and so on. It's also striking that uh, the, this is a set of disorders that, uh, in terms of disability, seems to affect females more than males, even though you know, males have more autism, more schizophrenia. But, uh, but females uh, cross-culturally have more of the really common, most common uh, of the disabling disorders, which, is, which is, are mood disorders, major depression uh, and some of the anxiety disorders, which in aggregate uh, are major depression is the leading source of disability in this country and in Europe with the single exception of chronic low back pain. That, that does cause more missed work than, than depression. But anyway, these are very, very severe problems. The, the, but the issue is, uh, if I'm gonna be really reductive, uh, we, we, uh, and we, we can ignore the benzodiazepines for a second, uh, we really only have three drugs. We have lithium, we have a whole family of very similar antipsychotic drugs, and we have a whole family of very similar antidepressant drugs. Now, don't get me wrong, we wouldn't be without these. These have been miraculous clinically. But the prototype for the antipsychotic drugs was identified, this was uh, chlorpromazine, in 1951 uh, in a search actually for new antihistamines. It turned out it was an antihistamine, lots of other things too, but also blocked D2 dopamine receptors. And all has been a really very useful second generation of antipsychotic drugs. The obligate target of all antipsychotic drugs is still D2. The same, the very same tar molecular target of the first prototype drug. And for antidepressants, you know, we have uh, uh, the modern SSRIs and selective SNRIs and so forth. But again, the molecular targets remain uh, generally the presynaptic uh, reuptake transporters, and the mechanism is increasing uh, norepinephrine, serotonin, sometimes dopamine, and synapses. And the other thing, that maybe shouldn't be such a surprise, uh, but uh, efficacy, uh, with the sole, still mysterious exception of an antipsychotic drug, clozapine, which was also serendipitously discovered in the early 1960s, efficacy stalled literally with the prototype drug. So the current antidepressants are much safer, they're more tolerable, and, and this is not trivial. When I was uh, um, uh, in training in psychiatry, we would be terrified to prescribe antidepressants because people could kill themselves with a five-day supply, and here they were depressed and suicidal, uh, and today's drugs are very safe, very tolerable, but the efficacy is no greater, and some would say not quite as good, as the very first drug, uh, imipramine. And the benzodiazepines are less and less used, but they're still useful as, as anxiolytics. So this is really quite dispiriting, especially because uh, in the 1940s and 1950s, as lithium, the antipsychotics, and the antidepressants sort of appeared out of the good observations of humans responding in unexpected ways to compounds they were given, uh, there was a sense that this would just keep rolling and that uh, uh, psychiatry would be able to um, 
climb out of the psychoanalytic pit in which it found itself and uh, have this whole uh, generation of effective therapeutics. Not so. In fact, in uh, about really only about five or seven years ago, uh, the uh, European regulators, the EMA, basically said, you know what, um, every time there's a new antidepressant, uh, it's heavily marketed and it costs European governments several billion dollars. And you know what, uh, you haven't advanced efficacy you know, in more than half a century. And so we're not, I, I don't know that this was the right policy decision, but they basically said we're not going to even approve another antidepressant unless you can show greater efficacy or you have a companion biomarker, so at least we know who might respond. And of course, we don't know how to do that. Uh, that's pretty embarrassing. But that began or accelerated an exit of industry out of this, uh, this field. Uh, something that, by the way, motivates us at the Stanley Center and I hope motivates this community because we have to sort of get this therapeutics ball rolling again. Um, and uh, basically, if you, you know, I know there are some people from, uh, in the audience, you know, from local uh, pharmaceutical companies, and of course, um, <laughs> you all work on CNS, but if you ask management, you know, how do you want to spend your marginal dollar? Do you want to spend it on cancer where there's, you know, hot and cold running targets, and by the way, the pricing is out of this world, or do you want to risk, you know, uh, the 40th, you know, antipsychotic drug? It's quite clear that how they've made their decision, and uh, and what they say, it's hard to argue, is there's a dearth of new molecular targets, um, and the human brain. And this is one of the key problems, again, for this community to worry about, is inaccessible in life, right? I mean, imaging is absolutely wonderful, it's amazing to be able to peer into the living human brain structurally, functionally, but, uh, but that's very different from being able to get tissue um, in, in, in the living brain. Uh, so cancer biologists, you know, wait outside the OR and the surgeon does an excisional biopsy and routinely hands the scientist the cells, the disease. Uh, we, we can't do that. This is a skull from a Inca trepanation, they used to let evil spirits out. This is considered uh, impolite, I IRBs will not allow this intervention. But as silly as that sounds, you know, it, it wouldn't even help all that much because our diseases are not cell autonomous as cancer is. Our, as, as Bob already alluded to, our, these diseases in the end require cell-cell uh, connections and uh, complex circuits. So this would say that what we really need then are good animal models of diseases. But the problem is in the last few years, uh, after relying on really drug assays, I'll come back to this just in a second, uh, there's a real disillusionment with the animal models uh, that, that we have, or at least some of the typical ones, which is not to say, I think some people are throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We're not going to do without animal models. Uh, but except for some rare monogenic forms of autism uh, where we can at least, you know, uh, put penetrant genes into a, a, a mouse or other organisms genome, uh, we really don't even know how to go about modeling, say, you know, depression or where we, we, we basically have no genes uh, or even schizophrenia where we have lots of genes but they're all of low penetrance as you'll hear. And there are no biomarkers for clinical trials. And again, I've heard heads of discoveries at pharmaceutical companies basically say, well, look, we have to conduct these very, very large clinical trials. We get these tiny effect sizes if we're lucky because we don't know ahead of time who is really a good candidate for this therapeutic. So we have a pretty, you know, pretty tough assignment here. And, you know, we, I think, I, I've asked a lot. I, I asked, you know, even, even back in the late 90s when I was at NIMH, you know, what has gone wrong? And, you know, in some sense, these, these serendipities that launched the era of modern psychopharmacology were a clear clinical blessing, but they became sort of an intellectual curse, which doesn't mean we necessarily would have done better focusing elsewhere, but we allowed the mechanisms of the existing drugs to really rivet our attention on a very small amount of brain function. 
So in terms of serendipity, so this is Alexander Fleming, and everybody knows uh, the story, right? He was uh, left his, uh, his petri dishes out, and they got moldy. And uh, instead of throwing them out, he saw the rings of uh, clearing of the bacterial lawns and realized there might be an inhibitory substance, which turned out to be penicillin. Uh, and here is Henri Laborie, a uh, French surgeon, and I suppose they all do look like this, dress like this. Um, he, uh, he, he was interested in uh, antihistamines, as I said. Roan Poulenc, a French drug company, was working on them, and they gave him this compound Thorazine, uh, which uh, you know, nobody knew about D2 dopamine receptors in 1951, but you know, it had this property. And he gave it to his uh, patients as a pre-anesthetic. He was really impressed with its sedating properties. He called up his buddies, uh, DeLay and Deneker, at the psychiatric hospital. He said, why don't you try this on some of your agitated psychotic patients? And they did. And lo and behold, the sedation turned out to be a side effect that they developed tolerance to. But what was amazing is that over a few weeks, hallucinations and delusions started to melt away. And, and chlorpromazine, this also tells you that regulators were different than was approved in the United States to treat schizophrenia in 1954. Uh, right now, it would still be in toxicity testing, probably. Um, but, you know, Laborie and his followers got stuck, and Fleming didn't. So what was the difference? Well, the difference is that in microbiology, one could begin really immediately to vary what was on the Petri dish. You could find other soil bacteria, streptomyces, other molds different bacteria on your lawn. And pretty soon, you could also begin a much more reductionist, biochemical, and ultimately later genetic analysis of these microbes and, 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 and use this sort of kind of thinking to discover new antibiotics. Now, you know, in psychiatry, we couldn't, couldn't do this. Again, the brain was inaccessible. We didn't have this kind of reductive biology. But what happened was uh, people said, well, look, what do these drugs do? What do they do to an animal? And are there other compounds that will do the same thing to an animal? Um, for antipsychotic drugs, the first tests really were based on the Parkinsonian side effects you get by blocking dopamine D2 receptors. So animals would fall off a rotor rod. Um, later, uh, we uh, have enshrined a pharmacologic tautology. You inject amphetamine which releases dopamine, the animals run around, you screen a drug, it blocks dopamine D2 receptors, and lo and behold, maybe you have a new antipsychotic drug because you have a D2 blocker or dopamine blocker that crosses the blood-brain barrier. Now, the people who came out up with these kinds of tests weren't dumb. They, they basically worried always that this could be just a way of rediscovering the same mechanism again and again, but it could have been a way to discover Truly, maybe this really was a way of modeling antipsychotic drugs in general. Or in the case of antidepressants, uh, putting a rodent in a beaker of cold water and the rodent will struggle and then it will float. Uh, and if you give it uh, imipramine, the index compound, or drugs like imipramine, it will struggle for longer. And then a terrible thing happened. Behavioral pharmacologists call this floating, which is probably wisdom, right? Why hydrolyze? more ATP while waiting for this idiot to pull me out of the beaker, you know, it became, floating became behavioral despair, right? This anthropomorphic term by which people deceive themselves. Serious people, I mean, it's just, right? So we got into this, you know, self-fulfilling prophecy, even came up with this idea of predictive validity. That is, if, if an animal, you know, assay pre discovers a new drug, Maybe that validates it in, in some way. And then this worst concept of face validity. So if, if this reminds me of what a depressed person would do, I don't know, uh, you know, then it's a model of depression. So we, we've been, we were stuck for decades, literally for decades. And, but at the same time, so now we get to the more optimistic bit, although it stays hard. Um, at the same time, it was always known that there had to be molecular clues lying around in our genomes because um, 
these disorders are among the most heritable of all relatively common disorders. So on this side, this is a nice uh, piece of work from uh, Irv Gottesman uh, that shows basically that the more DNA you share with somebody who has schizophrenia, the greater your risk of having schizophrenia. So a monozygotic twin, if you have a monozygotic twin with schizophrenia, you have a 50% risk. The, the population base rate is something just under 1%. You know, if you have a dizygotic twin, it's 15%, uh, uh, another first degree relative, 10 to 13%. It's interesting, these suggest that there may be some environmental effect, some epigenetic effect, but the point is the more DNA you share, uh, the, the, the greater your risk. And the heritability is based on twin methods for autism are in the 0.65 to 0.8 range, for schizophrenia, 0.8, for bipolar disorder, just slightly less. So, so, so Genes have a lot to say. They're not fate, right? Uh, here, the monozygotic co-twins have only a 50% concordance, although the unaffected co-twin we now know has a thinner cerebral cortex than, uh, than more distant relatives and has some cognitive impairment, but doesn't have schizophrenia, doesn't have psychosis. So genes are not fate, but they're very, very influential, but we couldn't find them. So uh, again, just uh, you know, autobiographically, when I was NIMH director, people were doing, looking in families that uh, seemed to have very high density of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. And what they thought was that a highly penetrant gene that would be discoverable with the methods of the day must be segregating in these families. And this turned out not to be right. Uh, and, and we'll come back to that in, in, in just a bit. But, um, you know, you can understand the field really was desperate for some molecular clues, and, and, and this method went on and on beyond its uh, potential utility. In fact, uh, one, one of the things I did, I had this committee looking at genetic studies at NIMH, and we knew we needed sample size. I actually had this guy, Eric Lander, this was 1998, as a member of the committee. Um, and uh, you know, little did I know, but um, uh, that, that we would start a lifelong relationship. But, um, but one of the things we tried to do is to get people to actually share uh, their results and their data to try to increase the power. But in those days, you know, people would rather share a toothbrush than their data because they all thought just, you know, with, with just one more family, they would, would get it. So that didn't really work. So I basically started paying for these uh, linkage analyses as a way of banking DNA for the future. And uh, uh, it was a great idea. And we banked many hundreds of uh, DNA samples, except that it was pathetically small, as it turned out. It turned out to be just a drop in the bucket. But, Nonetheless, these, these studies didn't give us durable findings because uh, the, uh, the, the, the genetic architecture of these diseases is incredibly complex. And to cut to the chase, most of you know this, you know, many hundreds of genes, maybe over a thousand, are involved in different people in different families in creating the risk of autism and an overlapping set for schizophrenia and a different overlapping set for bipolar disorder. And uh, maybe hundreds of genes, maybe more, maybe 5% of our genomes for each illness. Uh, and within those genes, there may be thousands of different uh, variants, different alleles. So the, the idea that you could solve these needles in a haystack looking in 10 families with six affected or eight affected people you know, was statistically impossible, but nobody knew that. So we were waiting for technology. And then again, autobiographically, uh, you know, I had done, as Bob said, I'd done very basic molecular neuroscience, but having been NIMH director and having been exposed to the suffering and the disability, I really wanted to do something translational, and I was in absolute despair of doing it. So I took a, uh, what was planned to be a five-year timeout, turned out to be a 10-year timeout, um, at, at, at Harvard, uh, and uh, while I was in the timeout box, um, um, an amazing thing happened. We got advances in genomic technology where the cost of sequencing DNA came down approximately a million fold. Uh, we got the ability to make 
human embryonic stem cells and then iPS cells. We got the ability to engineer them with relative ease, first with uh, zinc fingers and then talons, and then as everyone in this community knows, uh, uh, Fung, wherever you are, you know, with uh, CRISPR and, and now son of CRISPR and then daughter of CRISPR, you know, I mean, and, and, and so we can begin to shuttle genes in and out of organisms and cells and all kinds of technologies for systems neurobiology. So all of a sudden, it becomes possible to stop play acting at science and do science, but it's really hard. And we all, you know, again, I hope lots of people here are in this together. So for ancient common variants, you know, there are now gene chips. They have about a million SNPs on them, but you know, a million SNPs, even though they're, they're, they're more, maybe 10 million common SNPs in the genome, mark haplotypes, you know, blocks of DNA that tend to segregate together, and we can get a pretty good idea of loci in the genome associated with risk. And now there's a, a, a psych chip, uh, Ben Neal uh, at the Stanley Center was the key architect, but it was a community effort that gives you a good GWAS array and a rare variant array, but also people got to nominate something like the 50,000 favorite loci, including copy number variants involved with psychiatric disorders. And already people are thinking about the second version. But right now, for 70 bucks, you can do, you know, uh, uh, a psych chip on somebody. And that, that includes, you know, I'm a former provost, so that includes overhead and, you know, fringe benefits uh, for the machines, for the robots. Um, this is amazing, right? You can study an awful lot of people. Now, one thing happened in human population history, which is that uh, we percolated along in these ancient populations with a you know, few tens of millions of humans, and then we had the Neolithic Revolution, learned how to farm, and then we had the Industrial Revolution, uh, and then we had McDonald's uh, going the other way. Uh, but Human populations um, expanded from uh, literally, let's say at the time of the Industrial Revolution, maybe a quarter of a billion people to about eight billion people today in 10 or 12 generations. So no time for cleansing natural selection. About 60 new mutations per you know, new human being. And so um, there is this staggering number of rare and ultra rare and private variants that one couldn't possibly array on a chip. So we have to sequence, but again, the, with the cost of sequencing coming down, this now becomes feasible. Now, common variant analysis, I think most of you know this, uh, involves uh, finding that a SNP in an adequately powered sample uh, is more associated with schizophrenia than with um, unaffected individuals at the most simplistic level. So this is a Manhattan plot. Of, um, this is from more than a year ago. There's actually more information now. These are the chromosomes arrayed at the bottom from one uh, on down. This is uh, the, the, the minus log 10 uh, probability. And this red line, which is sort of, uh, you know, sort of the, I think Mark Daly kind of invented this, but it's basically P less to equal to 0.05 corrected for a million comparisons. And this is sort of like the threshold that the community accepts that something is durable, that it's not going to go away, and you can publish it. But with 37,000 cases of schizophrenia and 113,000 controls, there were 108 you know, independent loci. So these are not individual causative variants, but you know, chunk, reasonably sized chunks of DNA that increase the risk of schizophrenia. But you know, about a third of them clearly pick out a single gene, which is good, and about another third maybe is two or three genes, and some of them have you scratching your head. But what's really important here is the average odds ratio, if you have one of these risk variants, is only 1.08. So each one increases risk by only 8%. So we have to bear this in mind as we do biology, right? That this is going to be pretty challenging. Now, just to sort of 
illustrate the, the, the issue with these loci, the first thing is that, as I've said, they're chunks of DNA, so they have to be fine mapped if you want to find the causative variant. The second thing, across all of these genome-wide association studies, across all of biology, about 90% of the variants are, are in regulatory regions. And that's challenging because, uh, we, frankly, it's a lot easier to think of biological experiments to do with coding variants than with regulatory variants. I mean, some regulatory regions are really well understood, but many aren't. Uh, but also, this kind of illustrates the, the, again, if you think about how we're going to interrogate the function of these loci. Um, so this is, uh, this is just a cartoon of uh, an L-type calcium channel, uh, and uh, one flavor has a, a, an alpha-1 subunit encoded by the gene CACNA1C. And there is a rare, highly penetrant gain-of-function mutation that causes something called Timothy syndrome, which is a very severe illness with autistic features, intellectual disability, seizures, facial dysmorphology. And it can be lethal. It's an L-channel. Won't surprise you. There, there can be cardiac arrhythmias. This is the variant in the very same gene associated with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, both. And um, this is in a, putatively, in an enhancer within an intron. And there is still not full agreement as to what this, in, what the risk variant does compared to the uh, non-risk variant, but it's thought that it's a modest loss of function, maybe it decreases expression by 10% in a subset of neurons in the brain and other cells that happen to utilize certain transcription factors. So you, you get the, the, the difference between, you know, rare penetrant near Mendelian disease and what we're dealing with in, in schizophrenia, but multiplied maybe by a thousand. Well, rare protein altering alleles, so alleles in uh, protein coding regions, are more neurobiologically actionable, I mean, for all of us, right? Just easier experiments to do. And the idea was that since these are recent, a lot of them might be more penetrant. Um, and uh, there are two designs. So the first design that is generally used is, is something called the TRIO study, uh, two healthy parents and uh, an affected offspring. It's been studied most in autism and schizophrenia. And these are really, in many ways, different illnesses. Because in autism, a certain percentage, 5%, less than 10%, have sort of rare Mendelian forms, some of which are due to de novo, that is in the, in the offspring, single base changes, that uh, cause a recognizable uh, change in the gene, usually early truncation of the gene. So you get a non-functional gene and basically haploinsufficiency. Uh, that, that's a bit, a bit carelessly used there, but, but I think it carries. And, and, and across many sites, including one here uh, that Ben Neal was, um, was the first author on, but also you know, uh, Matt State and, and Evan Eichler and a group at Cold Spring Harbor, people have coalesced on a, on a certain number of genes uh, Caitlin Samoha in Mark Daly's group has a very nice model showing that these are genes that are constrained in evolution, that is, they have fewer mutations, far fewer mutations than you would expect based on the uh, nucleic acid sequence. And if you get a truncating mutation in one of these, you know, bad things happen. Um, and uh, uh, in some ways, they are not so dissimilar to some of the monogenic disorders that Mark Bears here has worked on Fragile X and on. Uh, maybe may RET, um, but these really are the minority, and people are going to do excellent biology on these, uh, but we'll come back to, the, again, the challenge for the human, and I think everybody is, is struggling with that. For schizophrenia, this strategy has not paid off. It doesn't look like there are, there's a big signal, um, and maybe Autism begins so early in life, these damaging developmental mutations, you know, have a chance to act. Schizophrenia has onset late teens, early 20s. There are some rare childhood onsets, but 
uh, we're not seeing a lot of these really damaging uh, de novos. The other strategy to get to actionable neurobiology looking at protein altering variants is simply case control. And uh, again, this is made possible by the ability to sequence. Uh, right now, it's really important that we're mostly sequencing whole exomes, all the protein coding genes, cost about 300 bucks. Uh, whole genomes are, you know, we're, we're beginning to, to sequence whole genomes. I'll talk about that in a bit. But, you know, this is, uh, this is one to two percent of the genome. The data generation from whole genomes is enormous. It is challenging to handle. Um, probably the only way to deal with it is to have everything in the cloud and compute in the cloud. And if you want your primary data, we'll send it to you in a moving truck with tapes because there isn't the bandwidth to download it. But even more important, that it's kind of silly, but the mo most important thing is we don't really know how to interpret a lot of what goes on in whole genomes. I suppose there'll be regions where there's a GWAS signal, you know, in what looks like a gene desert, and that will focus our attention. We'll learn over time, but right now, whole exomes are just much more efficient. And again, one thinks one knows what kinds of experiments one might do. The problem is, I told you this parable about human, the expansion of human population um, since the Neolithic Revolution because uh, there's, it, what it tells you is there's an enormously high background rate of variation. Now, some of it's associated with other illnesses, but a lot of it's just neutral variation, even if it changes the protein sequence, right? You know, it might change one amino acid to another in a way that is not particularly harmful. It might be in some you know, carboxy tail somewhere, waving in the breeze, not hurting anything. Um, and uh, the other thing is, I think to everybody's disappointment, um, everybody I know actually thinks they predicted this, but I didn't, that, you know, we're not seeing highly penetrant alleles among these rare and ultra rare variants for the most part. So there has been a uh, whole exome sequencing of 6,000 people with schizophrenia, say from Sweden, and no single gene is statistically significant. Now, people go to great lengths, two papers in Nature, can't complain, but, uh, but the way to get significance out of this is to overlay the data with very theory-laden gene clustering, some of which really makes no sense at all. I mean, look, uh, you know, it's, it's exciting to do, but, you know, one of the gene clusters uh, was, uh, is, is, is associated with the, the marker is, is ARC, which is a protein which is induced by neural activity. Um, and if you look at that as a cluster, you can think you find significance. The trouble is the ARC cluster is co-regulated. It's not all in the same cell. It's not in the same complex. So I would say let's, you know, let, as, as much as we're in a hurry, let's back off and see if we can uh, actually determine whether any of these gazillions of protein-altering variants really matter for the disease. And the reason to say that is, uh, as most people in this room know, once you start doing a biology experiment, uh, then, then you're really in deep, right? Then you have you know, reagents and people and a commitment. And uh, I, I, I wouldn't want to be responsible for sending you on a wild goose chase. I'd really, you know, want to have some sense that, that, that this variant is telling us a story. So what are we going to do? Uh, well, we, we're going to, as you'll see in a minute, we're going to vastly increase the sample size, try to get more power. We could focus on those genes that have rare protein-altering variants that we already know are significant by GWAS. And there's a great story already that I'll just touch on uh, uh, in a minute that Jen Pan is working on He's here. Um, we could focus on interpretable categories like the loss of functions, which you see in, in autism. But that's not going to get us uh, very far in terms of common forms of autism, schizophrenia, bipolar, ADHD, and the like. We can very, very carefully use complementary insights from biology. Some, some variants may be so rare that we're going to run out of humans before we get a p-value. And if we're going to put together a biological story, 
you know, it's so easy to fool yourself because you come at it with your priors, but maybe, you know, you see the directionality of, of something from a GWAS that is genome-wide significant, you know, for common variants you can achieve statistical power, and look at an allelic series and see if they converge, but we really have to be very skeptical uh, when we do that. But I think it's, 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 it's beyond question. We're just not, the, the, we're just not going to have enough samples, ultimately, to, to get the kind of statistical significance by itself that can assure you that when you do biology, you're working on something we know is involved in autism or schizophrenia. Um, one thing I've been thinking about, I haven't convinced, it's too early, but using, you know, stem cell technology in CRISPR-Cas9 or in animals, uh, uh, can we create sort of sensitized screens, you know, the way people do in Drosophila in different ways? Can we, can we take uh, uh, stem cells that come from patients and make them neurons and actually remove some, you know, uh, correct or rescue some, some risk alleles? And, and, and create a, uh, a cell system in which we might then, in adding, testing new alleles of interest, we might see an effect. Can we begin to humanize, uh, slightly humanize, the marmosets that are now living somewhere happily at MIT? Again, to create, we don't know barely enough. We've just, I don't think we've quite assembled our whole genome sequence yet, but, you know, can, can we, over time, humanize enough genes so that we, again, have a somewhat sensitized screen to look at these low penetrance alleles. Because, again, these alleles, you know, to, to make the point that explicit that's been implicit for, for, we all have risk alleles, right? We all have, for every, every common disease, and lots of people who have the disease don't have the one you're interested in. It's really the pile up of these. Plus, you know, bad luck, right? You can't wire up a hundred trillion synapses deterministically, plus some environmental interaction, which we don't yet fully understand. So, so, so maybe we can create genetically sensitized screens to uh, begin to understand what some of the other genes are telling us. And then a really critical principle, the reason that we want to find you know, lots and lots of these genes and not say, oh, we've got two to work on, we should just do that and then we'll come back, is because I think we're going to learn something from convergence, and I'm going to come back to that. Now, uh, Mark Daly and Ben Neal um, took some analyses are already in the literature and used those to sort out the fact that we shouldn't actually hold our breath waiting for highly penetrant alleles. So uh, in a number of Scandinavian countries, studies of fecundity have been done. And so let me just, I know this is really hard to read, but if you're a male with schizophrenia and you are compared with your unaffected sibling males, you will have about a quarter as many children. Females have a little bit more, uh, about 50%. Uh, Females tend to have a later onset with schizophrenia and, 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 and a somewhat milder course, but still it's a severe reduction. For a male with autism, um, the, uh, again, you have about a quarter as many children as your SIB. So in modeling this, what Mark and Ben and their colleagues have shown pretty convincingly is that any allele that increases the risk by more than 10 percent, that is 1.1 fold, is quickly washed out of the population. Evolution is very much at work. Right? These disorders confer a severe reproductive disadvantage. And it's the same, the reason that the de novo strategy uh, is so critical in autism is a lot of these just are not transmitted. These kids often, tra you know, with autism and, you know, uh, very severe intellectual disability are not going to uh, transmit uh, those alleles. So um, that's the situation. Right? We're going to discover lots and lots of these, but they're going to have low penetrance, and the ones that are protein altering are going to be sometimes so rare that we're not going to necessarily have a p-value. I th thought I said this was going to get more optimistic, but <laughs> we'll get there. Okay, so this is the way I think many of us not all of us, but many of us in the Stanley Center are thinking about 
these problems. And of course, there's a lot of room for argument. So the first thing is don't mendelize. Don't see your favorite gene and say, you know, that's it, you know, that's it, right? Because these genes, you know, work only in certain genetic backgrounds and so forth. Um, because these are genes of small effect, I'm gonna, you know, we, we have to assume that, that they act by converging on a much smaller number of pathways and molecular machines than there are genetic variants out there. If the biology doesn't work that way, then it's hard to uh, explain the, as heterogeneous as the diseases are, the relatively stereotypic age of onset uh, and symptoms. Um, we have to respect the cellular diversity of the brain. You know, um, in, if you work on liver, you're in luck. You know, you've got about three cell types, uh, hepatocytes and Kupfer cells and endothelia and a few wandering lymphocytes. But in the brain, you know, obviously uh, cell type is so important if only recognizing neurons and the different kinds of glia, excitatory and inhibitory neurons. But we all know that there are vast differences even among these subclasses. In fact, in the current brain project, we're going to find out maybe uh, uh, at least some approximation of how many different cell types there are. Uh, but the point is we're going to need a lot of single cell analysis. Uh, again, remember, a lot of the common variants are regulatory, so they're not going to be acting in every, in every cell. Um, I think we've learned that we have to respect evolution in the selection of models. And we have to ask, you know, um, Am I asking a question that can be answered in this organism, right, as we're interrogating the genes? Um, and at the same time, we have to recognize that we, you know, we say we're working on schizophrenia, we're working on bipolar disorder. There's no such thing, right? I mean, these diagnoses uh, uh, were, were designed to be categories picking out narrow cylinders of human psychopathology you know, through uh, august consultative processes, like, you know, I would say two psychiatrists have a donut and decide on the criteria for, you know. Um, these are, you know, very heterogeneous, uh, but, but they're really spectra. They are not discontinuous from health, something that Elise Robinson has been showing very clearly for autism uh, that, you know, People with diagnosable autism, people who are considered affected, just have a bigger pileup of risk genes than, uh, than, than, than people who are considered unaffected, but these genes have similar effects. They just, their effect gets attenuated as you have fewer and fewer. And yes, of course, genes by themselves are not, not fate. So one of the things we're going to have to do, since we know we're not able to ask people lots of questions and really know what's wrong with them, is we probably have to have to get a lot of genotypes and begin to have cohorts where we can recall people by genotype and then really phenotype them again with new biological hypotheses. Okay, now people ask, why do you guys care about alleles of small effect? So one answer is that's all there is, right? Uh, not a lot of choice. But I think what's really important is to remember, and this, this really goes for the GWAS where we really get statistical certainty is that if you are confident about a locus, that locus, if you find map it, implicates a particular gene. And if you think about the convergence on molecular machines, you know, look, if, you, if a gene, if, if uh, uh, it's not implicated, but if CAM kinase 2 were a risk allele, it might be for some diseases, it's in every cell in the body. But you begin to figure out what it might be doing if it's in, you know, a cell where you know, an NMDA receptor subunit or an AMP receptor subunit is also implicated. So you get this sort of uh, convergent cues. Uh, so, genes, so alleles identify genes, genes identify pathways, protein networks, biological processes, and cell types, right, where they, where they pile up. And so those are, those are really critical cues, uh, clues, and also the What's, what the allele does tells you the directionality. So, you know, a loss of function in, in some protein tells you maybe your drug is gonna have to slightly increase activity. So there's a lot of information, even though these are alleles of, of small effect. And I would remind you, you know, uh, 
uh, stat, you know, for statins, uh, the GWAS signal in the target of statins, HMG-CoA reductase, increases risk independently by 2%. So uh, it's just that in the pathway, it's the rate-limiting enzyme for cholesterol biosynthesis. So you put the genetic clues together with biology. Okay, so we, the hypothesis, this nice picture that Casper Lodge uh, gave me, that, that the hypothesis is that the combinatorial information will place these genes into disease-relevant pathways. So what I've told you with this, you know, almost perseverating, I uh, hope my frontal lobes are okay, on convergence, um, we, we have a long way to go. So th this is what we want to do in the Stanley Center in terms of the genetics. Uh, and, and what's critical is, uh, to say it this way, you know, we'd like to genotype and sequence uh, disorders of high heritability with really dramatic enough phenotypes that we're not totally reliant on the DSM that are not the most heterogeneous, so schizophrenia, bipolar, autism, ADHD, all highly heritable. And, uh, and we want to analyze them to diminishing returns, which we'll, I think we'll know diminishing returns when we see it. But even for schizophrenia, we're very much on the steep part of the gene discovery curve, uh, where there's no slowing down in gene discovery. So now in schizophrenia, you know, autism is lagging and bipolar is lagging behind that, but we'll catch up. This year, there are 60,000 cases that have been GWAS. There are actually something more than 130 independent loci known that, you know, I showed you the slide from the last publication. 6,000 exome sequenced, 1,000 genomes. And by 2018-19, we hope to have more than 100,000 cases GWAS, 40,000 exome sequences, um, uh, borrowing from uh, the, uh, you know, the military metaphor of the uh, Bush era, we call it the surge, um, and uh, maybe 10 cases of whole genomes. The other thing is um, we've been using population samples of convenience, these wonderful European, you know, biobanks and population registries and these well-organized health systems, but that's just a tiny sliver of human genetic diversity. And if we're really going to do this, we need to sample all of human genetic diversity, partly to find interesting rare variants, partly there'll be different allele frequencies, and partly if these diseases stratify really for global equity, right? We, we, you know, we have to assume that these chronic non-communicable diseases will stratify. And so you can see we're beginning, you know, uh, new waves. Uh, it, this is still Europe, of course, although Finland has some interesting population isolates, but in Japan, uh, in China, uh, we're going to collect uh, more than 30,000 new samples, and that, that could potentially expand. Shanghai has 30 million people. I mean, it's bigger than most European countries. And there's one big psychiatric hospital that sort of, through affiliates, can uh, ascertain most of the cases. Uh, we're starting in Mexico, looking at the admixture. We're really interested, obviously, in the Native American population. And we, we, we feel we really have to collect in Sub-Saharan Africa. We know that this is going to be difficult. We are trying to work with some British charities. Karsten Conan is leaving the, leading this to create training programs for investigators. Uh, we don't want to do safari research. You know, you give us your samples. We may remember to send you the paper. I mean, we can't. That's clearly terribly wrong. Um, we know it's going to be hard. But again, from a global equity point of view, but also human genetic diversity is greater in Africa by far than anywhere else in the world. So that's the genetics. Uh, clearly, uh, I've said we have to respect the cellular diversity of the brain. I'm going to go pretty quickly now. You know, uh, may, perhaps at Evan McCosco and Steve McCarroll's lab, working with uh, Aviv Regev, uh, developed a not very nice uh, high-throughput single-cell RNA-seq uh, procedure called DropSeq, which allows you to, you know, isolate cells from the brain. Still problematic, you know, you amputate processes, you know, there's more work to be done here. Uh, suspend them in droplets, um, prime your uh, RNA synthesis with a barcoded bead, and then you can massively parallel uh, do uh, RNA-seq. But for therapeutics, you actually need to know what these molecular machines are, these proteomic uh, interactomes. And single-cell proteomics is uh, not 
uh, not anytime soon that I know of. So we're doing single cell type proteomics where uh, Kevin Egan and Lindy Barrett are growing, you know, industrial quantities of I pretty identical, pretty, pretty good at this, you know, in this case, excitatory pyramidal neurons. We still have to, you know, get other neural types, uh, inhibitory uh, uh, interneurons, and people uh, helping with that are both collaborators from the outside, uh, maybe Gord Fischel, certainly Paola Arlotta here, and, um, and, and basically do interaction proteomics in these cells, and then check our work, and it's a very iterative, ugly process against human postmortem brain, maybe some animal brain, but to try to get a sense of, um, you know, what, what these, uh, what these, these machines are that are affected by risk alleles. Okay. Now you can get lucky with a lot of hard work. So in schizophrenia, so this is uh, uh, the famous postmortem study from David Lewis's lab, it's a very small number of brains, but we, we uh, do hope it's uh, true. Uh, it's in textbooks, must be true. Um, uh, you can see the, uh, the, 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 the dendrites and uh, uh, you can see uh, uh, these uh, very healthy looking uh, uh, cells. And then what you see is uh, in the two schizophrenia cases, especially this one, um, there's uh, uh, clearly a loss of uh, components and of synapses along the way that have, some people suggested, excessive uh, synaptic pruning. Um, and uh, uh, and um, along with this, I should say, um, um, with this thinning comes cognitive deficits. So one of the things that, you know, was discovered where maybe we're taking a leap maybe Jen Pan is taking a leap. Um, one of the risk alleles is CACNA1i. It's a calcium channel subunit that, that is, encodes the alpha subunit of CAV3.3, expressed throughout the brain, highly expressed in the thalamic reticular nucleus. And uh, lo and behold, uh, the TRN is entirely GABAergic. It controls uh, <laughs> sleep spindles, and uh, Dara Manoa, who's here, has established uh, with Bob Stickle that not only is that, uh, that, that sleep spindle activity is decreased in people with schizophrenia. Uh, and it's really interesting because sleep spindles probably represent some large calcium influx that might have to do with memory consolidation, which also may have to do with stage two sleep when you generate sleep spindles. So uh, this, this GWAS finding has pointed us toward you know, this cell group. Now, again, you know, uh, we need tool compounds to modulate this calcium channel, but this may not be a therapeutic target that, to help memory consolidation and cognition in schizophrenia. Maybe, uh, maybe calcium channel agonists will never turn out to be a good idea because of cardiac problems. Uh, but, you know, if we can study at the single cell level TRN cells, uh, which Gro Ping and colleagues are doing, you know, maybe we'll find other potential targets, clues to biology. But this is the way that, you know, that these, uh, these variants help us. And in the case of pruning per se, uh, now this isn't published yet, but I know that both Steve McCarroll and Beth Stevens have spoken about this, including at our symposium uh, just two weeks ago. Uh, but basically the biggest association peak for schizophrenia is in the MHC locus. Turned out not to be an HLA. There are actually three signals, but, but the biggest signal is with complement factor C4. And Beth Stevens had shown previously that, uh, that complement factors are the eat me signal that synapses display uh, in synaptic pruning. And uh, you, know, you can see wild type uh, C4 plus minus heterozygote C4 minus minus. Uh, you can see that. Uh, there's more pruning in the wild type and less pruning when you knock out C4. And uh, humans with schizophrenia have higher levels of C4. So again, this is a kind of thing that, you know, maybe, especially given the picture I showed you from the David Lewis lab and the, and the, and the scans, maybe schizophrenia is a 
it's partly a disease of over pruning where you know, a lot of synaptic genes are involved, but during synaptic pruning in adolescence, they don't s smell right to the microglia or they attract too much complement. It, it gives us a, a toehold. But the problem, of course, is that just it's like, you know, what are we gonna, so we're gonna modulate synaptic pruning? Well, under pruning is not so good either. So all of these things have sort of an inverted U-shaped dose response curve. So if we're gonna help uh, the people in the Stanley Center who are working on therapeutics, which includes Ed Skolnick, you know, um, to capitalize on this, we'd better have some real biomarkers for synaptic pruning. Um, so we're collaborating around the world, including Australia, where there's a very good schizophrenia prodrome study, trying to get uh, serial CSF measures to look for Complement metabolites, of course, we'll do unbiased proteomics at the same time, because who's gonna let you give a drug to a you know, relatively healthy 15-year-old, clearly getting into trouble, that will modulate pruning unless you have something more than just cognitive testing, right? We need, we need some biomarkers. So this is a, this effort to get to therapeutics, which begins in genetics, because psychiatry has been so without these clues, is going to take a long time. So I'm gonna end with the hard, hard problem, which is how to model these disorders. You know, how, you know, how are we going to understand what these genes are doing? You know, again, we've had some nice examples where we get pointed at the TRN, we get pointed at, at um, pruning, but for a lot of these genes, we don't know what cells in bipolar disorder. If you ask me what cells in the brain are involved in bipolar disorder, I couldn't begin to, I don't have a clue, right? So uh, we, we're clearly going to need um, animal models, uh, cellular models, and you know, mice obviously give us access to remarkable technologies like, uh, like optogenetics, but the problem, of course, is that these are relatively low throughput, but the lack of penetrant alleles really you know, makes it very, very challenging because you're not gonna see a phenotype with one or 10, and how did you choose which 10? And if you knock the gene out, that's not going to tell you, you know, imagine knocking out the L-type calcium channel, it might have side effects like death, uh, but it won't tell you what's happening in 23 neural subtypes where it's the promoter, you know, that is uh, slightly downregulated. Um, and, and so what we call uh, so, uh, low penetrance really means that the genetic background matters, the other genes and environment, but the other genes really matter. So um, how are we gonna get there? Well, the most important thing is, and I love this quote from uh, Dobzhansky, nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution. So we, we always have to ask if we, if we want a disease model, it's not like basic science where we can you know, choose any, anything we like as long as it gives generalizable results. We need, we, if we're gonna intervene in something, we have to say, you know, not just does this organism have you know, conditioned fear the way humans have conditioned fear, but does the molecular target we're interested in, is that conserved and are the cells and the circuits conserved all the way uh, to, to, uh, to humans? Some things, housekeeping genes, protein chaperones are conserved in yeast and then we should use yeast. It's a lot easier, but again, it really depends on the question you're asking and we haven't really been doing this effectively as a, as a community. And I, I think, again, this idea of matching models to questions. And I would illustrate this. So here's Kay sitting in the front row, works on fear. But, uh, but you know, in fear, we've learned an incredible amount because evolution has solved a lot of the basic fear circuitry, a lot of the basic reward circuitry very early on. But are these animals by themselves models of human disease, even if we increase, you know, uh, conditioned fear, do we have an anxiety disorder model? And the problem is that in humans, the, the illness not, doesn't only have to do with uh, the fear circuitry, but also with cognitive control exerted by the prefrontal cortex. And here, there are enormous differences between rodents and humans. And so what it tells us is we can learn an enormous amount in the rodent model, but then we have to think again about how we're going to incorporate the, the cognitive control aspects. And some of this we may or may not be able to do in rodents. So again, this is why uh, 
uh, evolution is so important. So I, I'm going to skip this and skip this. So in the end, we want to, we, again, we have to reach out to the whole community to um, figure out what models we can use. But in the end, we really, I think, we have to humanize a lot of our biology. So, you know, some of this has to do with iPS cells, some of this has to do with organoids. But I've also had already two workshops at the Institute of Medicine that has brought in regulators, you know, FDA, basically saying, what if we can't have an animal model? What do we do then? And trying to get them to move to a position where they are, by the way, for cancer, but not for CNS, where uh, as long as you've done toxicity and you know a compound is safe, um, I'd like them to say that, and we don't have such compounds yet, that we can test them in human subjects. Because how, how are we going to use you know, a pore salt test as an efficacy gate? Certainly no, uh, no scientific director in pharma would allow their CNS group to do that. Um, and, and, and so uh, I think we, again, as a community, we have this really tough problem of figuring out how to take this trove of genes and turn it into useful biological information. Uh, it's so much harder than cancer research because of the evolutionary recency and the inviolability, inviolability of the human brain. But I am optimistic. I think we can think about these things together and uh, hopefully make some really much needed progress. And so there are many, many two people, uh, many, many more people than I can uh, list or thank individually. I probably left lots of important people off of these, but I was running out of uh, room on the slide. But this really is a community effort, and hopefully more people in this community can become involved in the effort. Thank you very much.